turn that on, huh? Red is on, right? Red is on. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. Okay, we'll call this meeting to order. The regular meeting of the Desert Community College District Board of Trustees is now called to order at 9.35. You may join today's meeting in person at a limited capacity via Zoom webinar or watch the live stream from College of the Desert YouTube channel. These links are accessible by visiting the College of the Desert homepage. Roll call, President Hope, please proceed with roll call. Student Trustee Zarco. Present. Trustee Pettis. Trustee Odin. Present. Trustee Kinneman. Present. Trustee Gonzalez. Good morning, present. Trustee Stephan. Present. And I believe Trustee Perez is ill, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. And at this time, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. If I could have um, Trustee Gonzalez lead us in that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. You join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. You're welcome. At this time, we'll move on to the board meeting agenda. Pursuant to government code section 54954.2B2, the board may take action on items of business not appearing on the posted agenda upon a determination by a two-thirds vote of the board. If fewer than two-thirds of the members are present, a unanimous vote of those present um, determined that there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of the local agency subsequent to the agenda being posted as specified. Confirmation of agenda. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the agenda for March 15th, 2024? Seeing none, the agenda stands approved as presented without objection. Uh, public comments. Requests to address the Board of Trustees regarding regular agenda items, remote public participation is allowed and will be accepted in person by email to otp at collegeofthedesert.edu during the meeting and submitted for the record or by using the raise your hand function by joining the Zoom link. Pursuant to um, District Administrative Procedure 2345, each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes per topic. 15 minutes shall be the maximum time allotment for public speakers on any one subject, regardless of the number of speakers at any one board meeting. At the direction of a majority of the board, these limits may be extended. All comments must be submitted or brought forward prior to the end of the public comment section. As an additional note, this item is intended for members of the public who wish to speak regarding regular agenda items. An opportunity to address the board on matters not related to the agenda will be available during item 20.01 of today's agenda. Armando, are there any public comments that have been received? Madam Chair, there are no public comments at this time. Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll go to public updates. We have a proclamation for National Library Week. President Hope, please help us introduce our reader. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I'd like to ask Vice President Martinez Garcia to introduce our reader and uh, present a National Library Week resolution. Will Tatum Mahoney come up? Hi, Tatum. Thank you, President Hope, Madam Chair, and Board of Trustees. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tatum Mahoney. She is a computer information systems major here at College of the Desert. She is a member of the CODIS Club, which is the campus cybersecurity club. She is also a CSI student worker at our library, where she helps to solve technical problems for students and is always smiling, from what I understand. Uh, she's here this morning representing the library. Thank you, it's my first meeting. Okay, <laughs> uh, Proclamation National Library Week. Whereas libraries are not just about what they have for people, but what they do for and with people. Whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that foster a sense of belonging and community. Whereas libraries of all types are at the heart of their cities, towns, schools, and campuses serving their communities. Whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions and library workers and librarians fuel efforts to better their communities, campuses, and schools. Whereas librarians are leaders in their institutions and organizations, in their communities, in the nation, and in the world. Whereas librarians continue to lead the way in leveling the playing field for all who seek information and access to technologies. Whereas librarians and uh, where libraries and librarians look beyond their traditional roles and provide transformative opportunities for education, employment, entrepreneurship, empowerment, and engagement, as well as new services that connect closely with patrons' needs. Whereas librarians and libraries lead their communities in innovation, providing STEM programming, maker spaces, and access and training for new technologies. Whereas to adapt our changing world, libraries are expanding their resources and continuing to meet the needs of their patrons. Whereas libraries are cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. Whereas libraries are pioneers, supporting democracy and affecting social change with a commitment to providing equitable access to information for all library users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. Whereas libraries lead in working with diverse communities, including people of color, 
immigrants, and people with disabilities, offering services and educational resources that transform communities, open minds, and promote inclusion and diversity. Whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Now, therefore, uh, be it resolved, the Board of Trustees proclaim April 23rd to 29th, 2023, National Library Week. They encourage all residents to visit the library this week and explore what's new at your library and engage with your librarian. Because of you, our library leaders, li libraries transform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatum. It was wonderful because I could hear your smile throughout that whole presentation. So thank you so much. Um, at this time, we'll have the proclamation for the Desert Community College District Month. President Hope, please help us introduce our reader. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, uh, I'd like to introduce trust, student trustee Isaac Zarco to read the proclamation for Community College Week. Proclamation Desert Community College District Month. Whereas the more than 1,300 community and technical colleges, public and private in the United States have contributed enormous enormously to the richness and accessibility of higher education. Nearly half of all undergraduate college students in the nation today are enrolled in community colleges and whereas by providing educational opportunities at costs and locations accessible to all who are qualified, community and technical colleges have greatly enhanced opportunity for every ambitious student to enter post-secondary school programs. As community-based institutions, our school provide very varied programs and offer specialized training for more than 1,000 occupations and whereas the college serves over 460,000 residents in a 4,000 square mile service area called the Coachella Valley. College of the Desert is the only two year college in the district and offers education where students live and work with programming as diverse as the region we serve. The Coachella Valley has watched its community college transform with five campuses serving approximately 10,000 students. And whereas College of the Desert provides excellent educational programs and basic skills, career education, certificate, transfer preparation, associate's degrees, non-credit and distance education, which are continuously evaluated and improved. Our COD programs and services contribute to success, learning and achievement of our diverse students and the vitality of the Desert Community College District, surrounded areas and beyond. And whereas College of the Desert is the center of collaborations and innovations for educational enrichment, economic development, and quality of life in the Coachella Valley and surrounding communities. And whereas Desert Community College District trustees serve the global higher education community on a statewide and national level for the California Community College trustees and the Association of Community College Trustees. And whereas in recognition of the important contribution of community and technical colleges to our total education system. In 1985, the Congress authorized and recognized the President Ronald Reagan to issue Proclamation 5418, establishing a National Community College Month. Now, therefore, the Desert Community College District Board of Trustees recognized April 2023 as, district, as Desert Community College District Month. And thank you so much, trustee, uh, student trustee Isaac Zarco. Really appreciate you reading that. Um, at this time, uh, we'll move into the approval of the regular, regular meeting minutes. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the regular meeting minutes of February 15th, 2024? If there are no corrections to the minutes, they stand approved as presented. And um, at this time, we're going to move right into the reports. We have the Associated Students of College of the Desert, ASCOD. If I could have Kelly Merchant, the ASCOD president, um, up on Zoom, I'd appreciate it. I believe she's there. And I believe she's in here. Oh, that's the, okay. That's the AI. So, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Kelly was able to join us today. Okay. The, the report is also included as a written report in the agenda. Okay. So, uh, I know my fellow trustees will be interested in reading that report and we'll be able to uh, keep up to date with our ASCOD group. College of the Desert Foundation, if I could have Kathy Abbott, the Foundation Executive Director, come to the microphone. 
exciting. Well, good morning. You guys are in for a treat. Half of my uh, report didn't save, so we've only got two items on here. <laughs> So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I want to talk about State of the College. The 2024 State of the College is officially in the books. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Moss Companies, for their ongoing support and really helping us to make the event a success. Their video gave us all a sobering reminder of how much the college has grown uh, to meet the needs of the region that we serve. College of the Desert is fortunate to be positioned in a community whose generosity is a huge part of the fabric of this institution. I want to extend my immense gratitude to all of the sponsors who gave so generously, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. They can be confident their contributions will be invested right back into the students of our college who are working towards achieving their educational goals. Sponsors and guests left with positive comments. In fact, uh, the phrase, that was really great, was a common theme. I want to, in particular, thank our public information officer, Nicholas Robles, for his fabulous script, and my marketing team, Competitive Advantage, for the overall production of the event. I also want to thank my team. What happens behind the scenes is often a thankless job, but I am fortunate to have a group of hardworking individuals who care about our college and our students. I couldn't do it without them. And then finally, stepping out for College of the Desert, the foundation has one more fairly large, and I'm being modest there, <laughs> uh, event to go before we start winding down from season. Stepping out for College of the Desert is just a few short weeks away. Multi-platinum performer Clay Walker is set to take stage on April 4th, 2024 at the show at Agua Caliente Rancho Mirage at 8 p.m. Sponsorships and reasonable price tickets are available at codfoundation.org or on Agua Caliente's website as well. We hope that all of you will consider attending, sponsoring, or purchasing tickets. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you so much. And at this time, the California School Employees Association, um, CSEA, Omar Thimbris, CSEA president. Is it on? Okay. Good morning, Superintendent, President Hope, Vice Presidents, and Trustees. Uh, we find it fitting for Women's History Month to announce that we have elected three new women as CSEA board members. Marbella Ordaz. Marbella Ordaz, first Vice President. Diana Ortiz, Treasurer. Carlene Hart, Communications Officer. I would like to ask Marbella to introduce herself to you all. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. My name is Marbella Ordaz Topes, born and raised in the Coachella Valley and proudly from Oaxaca. Uh, it is an honor to represent all our women today, especially our Latina women. I started attending COD as a student in 2009 Later on, I got the opportunity to work as a student worker in counseling in the summer of 2013. I was offered my first full-time job in HR at COD. Currently, I have been working in the international program for nine years. What I love most about working at COD is the opportunity to inspire students to embrace change, deal with failure, embrace the unknown, and never give up. I always strive to ensure that my kiddos have a wonderful and successful journey at COD. As the first vice president of CSEA, my main objective is to remain true to myself while serving our members with the greatest honor. My goals include ensuring that our members are well informed about all the services and opportunities available to them, fostering a sense of community, trust, and healthy environment, and building strong relationships with various departments throughout the district. I aim to become the bridge between our members and COD so that we can continue to work collaboratively and towards our shared goals. Shout out to all my international and local students watching me, and to my dad, I love you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marbella. That was excellent. Um, as many 
be member from the Employee Awards in January. We had several of our members who were recognized for their 20, 25, 30, 35, and 45 year of service to the college. We would also like to extend congratulations to our members who were recognized for their five, 10, and 15 years of service. However, we would like to point out that many of these employees are still unhappy that their awards were not on par with previous years. Failing to read names and neglecting to invite 20 plus years employees on stage to be recognized is unacceptable. These dedicated employees are here daily, providing students and staff with many needed services. They deserve better. As we move into high school visits days in this April, we will be welcoming the 2024 graduating seniors to register for the summer and fall classes that are offered at all of our campuses. This event involves all CSEA members working diligently daily to make sure that these visiting students learn that college is a lot more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. We'd also like to remind all of you that there are still many buildings on campus that continue to leak during rainstorms. These are health and safety concerns that need to be addressed and fixed correctly. No more temporary patches. The faculty and staff that use these facilities on a daily basis need to have a safe health environment for our students to thrive. Again, we can do better. Before we conclude, CSCA joins with CODFA and CODA in asking for a revision to the process by which faculty concerns about aggressive and disruptive students' behaviors are addressed. As previously mentioned, the safety of our students and staff should be a top priority. We need to do better. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Have a great day. Thank you so much for that report. Uh, College of the Desert Adjunct Association. If we could, we have a written report that was submitted, and I know that my board members will all be reading that so that we know what's going on and what we can do that might be able to assist. Um, next is College of the Desert Faculty Association, CODFA. Oceana Collins, CODFA president. Come forward, please. Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. It's been a while. This is my first time this year at a meeting, so um, thank you. Uh, good morning, President Superintendent Hope, trustees, and College of the Desert community. Before I highlight some of the incredible work being done by our faculty, I would like to bring to our trustees' attention two concerns that our faculty body have been discussing. The first are, is the bot issue. As I wrote in my last report, the bots have become more sophisticated and detecting them is not as easy as it once was. I have been hearing an administrative push or rumors of an administrative push around campus to hold faculty accountable for bot detection as the last line of defense. Let me be clear, the faculty's job is to clear their rosters by census. This is usually done by dropping no-show students but many of our faculty have decided to also assign a bot test in their online classes. Unfortunately, this is no longer a foolproof way to detect bots. I would also like to dispel the idea that bots are only a problem in online classes. Many of my colleagues, including myself, had almost entire in-person classes full of registered bots making the faculty and the deans believe that in-person classes were full when in fact, many of them ended up being very low actual enrollment. The bot issue is a statewide problem, a complex problem, and a technological problem, and it is beyond the scope of faculty responsibility. Our association will maintain that faculty responsibility when it comes to bot detection ends at census submission. The second is faculty concerns over campus safety. Before I begin here, I would like to acknowledge that President Hope, 
a VP Val, or should I call him Super VP Val, <laughs> and Tim Nakamura have all been responsive to these concerns, but I want to put these concerns on our trustees' radar. First, our members are in favor of having security cameras in outdoor spaces to ensure the safety of our faculty and students. My understanding is that there are some in place, but we would like to see other areas monitored, particularly the South Annex, which houses a lot of our special programs and parking areas that are dark at night. In addition, faculty are asking for a revision to the process by which faculty concerns about student behaviors, particularly disruptive and possibly dangerous behaviors are addressed. We need to ensure that faculty concerns are being validated and thoroughly investigated. CODFA and the administration will continue to work through these issues, and I hope that we can come to a resolution that allows our faculty with these concerns to feel safe in the workplace. This has been a busy semester full of activities sponsored and organized by our esteemed faculty. Here is a brief glance of just some of the outstanding events by our hardworking faculty. Studio art professor Emily Madigan continues to hold regular events at the Marx Art Gallery, providing our students in the college community with a creative space to exhibit and appreciate art. Political science professor Mozilla Kazi Kone and counselor Mary Eden sponsored a series of fun and educational events for Black History Month. Theater arts professor Janet Miller and others in the dance and theater departments, or sorry, music, theater, and dance departments are busy working on two spring productions. The Dinner Party, which premieres tonight at the Pollock Theater and will run for two weekends, and Guys and Gals at the McCallum Theater for two consecutive consecutive weekends starting May 3rd. Professor, music professor Jenny Carey and the Student Social Justice Club sponsored an on-campus student voter information and registration drive. Biology professor Giuseppe Vizzoli, along with Cody McCabe and the GSD Pride Center, hosted Safe Schools Desert Cities Rainbow Youth Summit. Counselor Dr. Frank Ramirez and our fabulous Career and Workforce Solutions Center organized the Spring into Work 2024 Career and Job Fair. This is just a sample of some of the great work being done here at the college. Additionally, our faculty serve our students every day in small ways that most people don't see. Whether it's a counselor who spends extra time with a student offering additional support, or if it's a professor that puts extra hours in preparing for a class. It's these small acts of dedications to the students and to the community that make the institution strong and carry its reputation forward. Finally, all of this great faculty work is not possible without all the solid support from our CSEA colleagues, the administrative assistants, IT specialists, security, custodians, landscapers, and all of our support across campus. A unionized workplace is a more professional and dedicated workforce. Our associations make this institution strong, and I am grateful to every one of my dedicated colleagues in CODA and CSEA. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you so much for that wonderful report, Oceana. Thank you for bringing things to our attention. Academic Senate, uh, Dr. Corbin Wild. Hi. OK, so along with my theme of highlighting each individual Senate committee, um, today I am so happy to be able to sing the praises of our Faculty Development Committee, or FDC, um, which has steadfastly pursued its mission throughout the 2023-2024 academic year. They are dedicated to enhancing faculty growth and consequently enriching student success and learning experiences across campus. As we reflect on the accomplishments of the FDC, led by the absolutely singular Dr. Leif Jordan, it becomes apparent and that their efforts have significantly contributed to the professional development landscape within our institution. 
Um, throughout the year, the FDC has spearheaded various activities and campus events aimed at augmenting faculty expertise. Noteworthy among these initiatives was the Fall 2023 Flex Program, which despite encountering challenges due to a hurricane, um, was successfully transitioned to an online format. Thank you to Dr. Leif Jordan and Cheryl Etter, who without her efforts, this would not have been possible at all. Truly, I would like to take a moment here and pause and emphasize that Cheryl Etter is the one person who keeps our Senate running and the FDC and the Curriculum Committee far working beyond the scope of her position. Thank you so much, Cheryl. We can't do it without you. Additionally, the Spring 2024 Flex Pro, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Give us, give us a little Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Seriously. We only look good because Cheryl's making us look good. Um, Without Cheryl, none of this work is possible. Additionally, the Spring 2024 Flex program featured a keynote address by Dr. Natalie Allen, uh, facilitating faculty engagement with OERs through a workshop session. FDC planned Flex events are stewarded by our amazing faculty, sharing the things they know and are learning across campus, and they're always received positively by attendees. The FDC has diligently reviewed and supported faculty endeavors, approving six sabbatical research projects that you will be seeing on your agenda today, and facilitating professional advancement through salary range advancements for deserving individuals. These projects have long-lasting impacts for our faculty and students. We are a faculty body that wants to learn as much as we want to help others learn as well. Um, one of the hallmark achievements of the FDC has also been uh, the enhancement of the FLEX program's management and reporting mechanisms. A new submission system has allowed us to really drill down into the type of sessions that are not only desired, but also very popular amongst our faculty. Um, I want to shout out all of our our hardworking individuals on this committee, uh, Dr. Jordan, Cheryl Etter, Dorothy Anderson, Emily Madigan, Diane Terrace, Robert Holmes, Frank Ramirez, Marcella Castillo, Victoria Curry, Jamil Martada, Edith Rojas, and Linda Emerson. They work really hard and they put all their care and consideration into making sure our faculty have opportunities to learn. Um, okay, are you ready? Here comes the money thing. Buckle up, this is gonna be good. Um, as of the March 2024 meeting, the FDC has judicially managed its financial resources, utilizing the entire annual budget of $60,000 to ensure that our faculty have access to learning to grow our understanding of not only our disciplines, but larger issues within the community college system. Our students will undoubtedly benefit from these models of our faculty as learners, but also from the material that they bring back. Um, despite very prudent management and success $60,000 does sound like a lot of money. Uh, there is an increasing demand for professional advancement as well as increased costs associated with professional development. Um, conferences are much more expensive than they used to be. So to gain access to this information costs much more than it used to. Um, FDC has been doing a great job handling the money. However, we need more if we want to continue to grow and develop as a faculty body. Um, it's only, what, a month into spring semester about, right? And our, it's gone, right? Everything's gone. If there's something that comes up, uh, faculty will not have access to learn more. So I would like to put that in front of the board that we do need more financial resources in order to uh, continue to pursue the excellence in education through our faculty development committee. Uh, last but not least, I just really want to emphasize that our Faculty Development Committee has demonstrated unwavering commitment and effectiveness in advancing professional development, and we are a faculty body that wants to learn and share that campus and community-wide. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah, good? Yeah, oh, I like that. All right. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll move into the governing board reports. Student Trustee Zarco. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing good, great, fantastic, and all that. As the semester progresses, it feels like the coming to the end of a journey. And this semester has been speedy, so it makes that feeling even stronger. This past month, I participated in some events. On February 15th, it was ASCOT's third Lunch and Learn series event. And as some of you know, that has been the series of events I've been working on for a couple months now. It seems to be getting better with every single time with each new event. We were able to serve about 60 to 70 students at this event while having a full room. I wanna thank the presenters of all previous Lunch and Learns along with this one, because one thing they have all been able to do is keep students engaged at the events. The reason for this event being on scholarships is because of the timing. I like to call it this time of the year scholarship season. We all know scholarships are important and it felt right to make this Lunch and Learn the subject of matter. 
Scholarships have impacted me in only positive ways, whether it helps myself financially or enhance my academic experience. Scholarships are opportunities for all and opportunities can change students' lives. Scholarships are done well here at College of the Desert and I'm fond of that. On February 29th was State of the College event, an experience to have and an opportunity for networking. I wanna say that everyone was on their A game with the outfits, so everyone was looking fly. Everyone was looking sharp and all. My experience with the event was one to remember. As we were doing photo shoots for Roadrunner Express and rehearsal for the stage, it made me feel super included as a student and I hope that inclusion grows more in the future. The event was overall excellent and was well put together. Midterms are rolling around the corner, so I wanna wish best of luck to all my peers and everyone working at College of Desert. That concludes my report. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, Trustee Perez is not with us today. Uh, Trustee Oden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last, last month on February 21st and 22nd, I attended um, a symposium at UCR on health disparities. It was really outstanding. Um, they especially talked about some of the health disparities for underserved populations, specifically Latino and black populations within Riverside County. And uh, it's really much too involved to go into, but some of the studies that they are doing are absolutely phenomenal. And so many issues that need to be addressed, and especially they talk about the student populations and health concerns and disparities. So that's something I think in the future we should probably take a look at. I also attended the Palm Springs Art Museum Black History Month program, um, attended along with so many of faculty, staff, and administration, the state of the college. I'd like to say to Nicholas, Kathy, and to Dr. Hope, out standing, absolutely outstanding. Um, I also attended along with uh, Chair Stefan, the Zoom accreditation meeting, and our faculty, believe me, you are appreciated. Our staff are, all of our employees here are appreciated, and your contributions to everything that we do are important, and your words are valued. Um, also attended the State of Education put on by Riverside County uh, Schools with the, and the superintendent, um, President Hope was there and Dr. Atkins was there. Um, it was really good to hear what's happening in all of our school districts throughout Riverside County, some of the programs that they are operating and the type of students that we can expect to receive. It was really cutting edge, so thank you. Um, also attended um, the two by two along with Trustee B. Gonzalez, uh, with Mayor uh, Mattis and Council Member Roger Nunes. And I heard what they were saying. And I think that there are issues that they express that we need to take seriously. Uh, so I'm looking forward to um, our superintendent bringing back some ideas to address the concerns. And I thank them for sharing it. We, we have work to do. We have work to do. There's a lot of healing that needs to take place between this institution and the communities that we serve. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do to address those. And so thank you for your suggestions there as well. Um, I spoke at the Sunrise Park Neighborhood Association um, and gave them an update on the Western Valley campus. There is so much energy and enthusiasm out there um, about what we are doing. So some of those issues and concerns about people and communities feeling disenfranchised because things that haven't happened in a timely fashion, I think are beginning to change, but we still have work to do. Um, I would like to say a special thank you to our superintendent in a special way for keeping us informed on issues of campus safety, whether they affect our students, our faculty, staff, 
or administration. These are important issues to all of us. And I would just like, if I could, indulge um, the board's time with a little extra time. Um, after Chair Stephan gave the report from uh, the report from the 2715 that dealt with uh, Trustee Perez, I don't know, I suffered a, a broken synapse. And I didn't respond. It, I, I, and I'm not sure if it was his response, but there were things that I wanted to say. And even though he's not here today, it's okay because I've already expressed these thoughts to him personally. Um, as a member of the subcommittee investigating the charges against Ruben Perez on the allegation that he violated board policy 2715, at the meeting, I, I already expressed, I experienced a broken synapse. I, did, I don't know, I blanked out. Um, but I spoke with Ruben face to face and expressed my thoughts and feelings afterward. And I felt like I had done him a disservice by not making my expressions public because of the public perception, perhaps, of the outcome of the report. These violations occurred before I came on the board, so I did not witness them firsthand. I did, however, review the transcripts and the video, and the college, to make sure that the findings were unbiased, the district hired a legal term, an outside firm, to conduct the investigation. I'd like to say that the findings did not reflect the person that I know. I worked with him, I find him to be kind, courteous, cooperative, and professional. I've known Ruben for a long time, um, when he was very young and his father used to bring him to Democratic Club meetings. So we go way back. And I'm proud of the man that he has become. His very presence speaks to an underserved population within the Coachella Valley and at this institution. Whether he opens his mouth or not, he speaks to an underserved population that are young men. Not just Latino men, but young men in general. Because when I was in college, the majority of the people in college were men. But that script has been flipped. And so we need his presence and his voice, and I want you to know that it's valued. Um, not just for men of color, but for all young men. It offers an option for the hegemonic, toxic masculinity that is becoming pervasive in our society today. I've been in public service most of my adult life. And I've done some things and said some things along the way that were not necessarily in my best interest or anyone else's. And I've learned from those. And to Ruben, I said, you are young, you are talented, and I believe that you have a very promising political career ahead of you. Protect yourself, even if it means protecting yourself from yourself. Chair Stephan, I heard what you said in that meeting, and I take it seriously that we all need to be mindful of the trust that we have been given um, and to be careful how we handle it and treat and speak to one another with decorum that honors the trust that the public has bestowed upon us. You know, when you reach a certain level of success, you're gonna generate haters. And there are people that would love to see him crash and burn. And I certainly don't want to see that. But the only person who can protect that is Ruben. Good luck, my friend. I wish you the best. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll move on to Trustee Kinneman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be extremely brief. I just want to thank the president, uh, the foundation, and our sponsors, and the business panelists for the State of the College event. It was very informative, uh, and it was in a very different venue that we're accustomed to, which I think was a nice change for us to be there at the Toyota dealership, and especially with the business panelists. They're speaking to us on the importance of this college 
and pre preparing people for the workforce. And that will conclude my report. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Trustee Kinnaman. And Trustee Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning again, everyone. Thank you for, for being here with us today. Uh, I also attended the State of the College, and you know, shout out to everyone who, who made it happen. Uh, beautiful charcuterie boards, dessert on point. I took an extra one, I'm not, I'll be honest, and I did eat it. It was really good. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, also, I attended, uh, even though I was there in a different capacity, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Sarah Fry, uh, Director of Nursing, for being acknowledged by One Future Coachella Valley. Um, that, I know that's one program that is so well respected and recognized in the community. And you know, hopefully, um, we'll be able to expand that one day to be able to accommodate uh, more, more students. I also attended the two by two with Trustee Odin and Desert Hot Springs. And, um, you know, I, I think he kind of summed it up a bit. So there was a lot of conversation. I thought it was a, a really good meeting. Um, and, you know, obviously I've heard their concerns for, for many years and that's where my advocacy has come from is in conversations with with Desert Hot Springs and not of my own uh, doing and thoughts. Uh, so I am looking forward uh, to us working closely with that city as well as the cities across the Coachella Valley since this college serves um, everyone there. So I'm just really happy that, uh, you know, we are bringing some hope from when I was first uh, elected in 2020 to now, the conversation definitely has shifted and, and I think that has a lot to do with uh, some of the investments that, that we've made and more to come. And I'm just happy to see that the relationship has progressed uh, nicely. Um, I also want to uh, just express my gratitude for all the women, the mujeres out there uh, doing all the work, holding it down, whether you're at home raising your children um, or are entering the workforce or completing your education, um, shout out. I'm one of your biggest fans. Uh, so just want to acknowledge uh, Women's Month and, and all the women out there that, that do so much for the community and for their families. And uh, other than that, I just want to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, looking forward to, to some corned beef and cabbage somewhere. <laughs> also, um, President Hope, I received a, a message in which uh, our county supervisor, uh, Victor Manuel Perez, is extending an invitation for 10 students of the college. So obviously, I'm not going to get involved in how you select those. And good luck, because I'm glad I'm not in charge. Uh, but there are, they are offering uh, 10 seats for students at the uh, State of the Fourth. So I'm um, just, again, happy to, to be here. And uh, that completes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to make my report very, very short. As you're all aware, I attended State of the College. Uh, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful seeing that many individuals in the community involved and uh, hearing all those wonderful statements about our college. You know, uh, sometimes trustees, I think we get caught up with all the negative stuff that comes at us. And uh, to see all the positiveness and feel all the positiveness from the individuals in the room, that was very, very heartwarming and we appreciate that. Just like we appreciate everybody that works for our college and I can't say that enough how much, how grateful I am because when things aren't going well up here um, and we know that we have faculty and classified employees and leadership that can make this college still function and be of great value for our students and give our students what they need and the community helping out to give the students what they need to be successful. It really makes it, um, 
it really eases a lot of the stress that we're feeling when things aren't going quite right. So uh, I really appreciate, uh, I appreciated the state of the college. I appreciated everybody that was there and uh, all of our, um, the, those people in our community internally and externally that are involved with us. Um, as my fellow trustee said, we also met with the accreditation leadership team. Um, I understand that our faculty and our classified were gonna meet later with the accreditation team and I hope that they felt that they could say anything they wanted. That's why the leadership team and the trustees and the president, none of us were there because we wanted you to have that openness with the accreditation team so that we can find out what we need to do to improve and to grow at the college because that's what we're about. Um, for the trustees, I have some very special things. As you know, we've been working on our evaluation process for this year. And as of this morning, um, the self-evaluation for the board members went out today. Now the self-evaluation, as I tried to explain last month, we're doing it in two parts. We've never done a self-evaluation where board members evaluated their own knowledge, their own expertise before. And we're not really gonna look at that and discuss it. What we're trying to do is accumulate data so that when we give training to the board members at our meetings, that we're giving training that uh, board members feel they need. Training that will help them individually with um, something they may feel that, that maybe they missed or maybe is lacking. Because there are so many areas that we are responsible for. Yes, we're only, we can only do certain things. But when we're evaluated by the accreditation teams, they evaluate us on so many areas. And you've seen the evaluation before on how we're supposed to evaluate our teams. But sometimes I know I've looked at that and I thought, wow, you know, as a team, I think we're meeting this, but I know that I could use more training in this area. And so this is to enable us, the first evaluation that went out today that we're asking you to turn into Armando um, so that he can collect that data um, is just on yourself. Where do you feel you need more training so that we can address those concerns, okay? And it will be, it will come back to the president and myself anonymously, and then we'll just try to get those trainings into our um, agenda study sessions throughout the year. Um, the second one will go out when we get those back. And that's the one where you evaluate our team. How do you think we did as a team of board members? Um, where were we lacking? Where are we not together? Um, what do we need to do differently for the next year? And uh, what are our goals for next year? Because once we get that together, then we can put together what we want from our president and how we, um, want things handled at that angle, you know? So um, it's gonna be very important that you try to get the first one back. We'd like all those responses about yourself by April 1st. Remember this one should be fairly simple. You either feel comfortable with the item or you don't. Um, and then the second one, we're hoping that we will have it, uh, it will go out one week before the next board meeting, and we're hoping that you will bring it back to the next board meeting if you don't submit it before then, okay? And that is the evaluation of the team, okay? Just, just so that you're aware of that. Um, there are a lot of events coming up. One of the things that um, Trustee Gonzalez and myself are, and the president of the college are scheduled to attend the GLI training, which is a government leadership institution, um, so that we can get further guidance in how to lead the college better. Um, it's usually a great event. It will be held next week, and I'm looking forward to it. I know I've attended it in the past, but it's always um, better if you have a team from the college that attends, and you're not attending by yourself or just with one other person. Um, the other thing that is coming up, and I was hoping that more trustees would be able to attend 
the chancellor's office is giving um, a special um, two-day conference, a uh, quick turnaround thing on that, in April. And that oh. is to introduce their goals for the next five to seven years. So um, I will be attending that um, and hopefully participating in some of the activities they have planned around that so that we can be up to date on that. Because as you're all aware, we're gonna be doing budget review at this meeting, this big study session. And uh, I decorated my uh, walker back there with um, the little leprechauns and the little money pots of gold and all, be hoping that everything would be positive might not be. Um, but the thing is, um, we have that to worry about. So we need to know how we can meet what the chancellor is hoping we will also be achieving in the next few years. But uh, we need to be a part of the voice in that. So um, that I think will be an important meeting and I hope I'll be bringing back a lot of information on that as well. And that's where I'm gonna conclude my report for today. But I do wanna say thank you to the foundation for their efforts on everything. And I hope everyone will be attending the stepping out for COD, uh, which is very important fundraiser for our students. And I also really wanna encourage everybody to attend the uh, play that starts tonight. I believe it is the dinner party. I saw that and I thought, wow, I gotta go to that. I haven't had a dinner party in a long time, so I want to see what that's about. Okay, so with that, we'll move on. And Superintendent President, will you provide, provide your report, please? Yes, thank you so much, Chair Stefan. Um, just a, a start to this uh, report, one of the things that I did this previous month is meet with Assemblymember Greg Wallace to discuss SB 895 um, and the letter of... Uh, support that I wrote for the college is on the screen now. SB 895, which is being sponsored by Senator Richard Roth, um, would allow 15 pilot colleges to award the um, Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. I think we are uniquely positioned to offer that degree, um, given the fact that our program graduates approximately 70 um, RNs and another 30 LVNs. I don't know of another community college in California that, that awards 100 nursing degrees um, in, a, in a year. So um, on behalf of the college, I uh, wrote this letter supporting our candidacy um, and support for the bill. Also discussed it with Assembly Member Wallace. Uh, also discussed some other uh, items of legislation that he's currently supporting. Uh, Darren Auden, and, uh, who's the president at Copper Mountain College, he and I will be meeting with his staffer um, because we have uh, you know, a difference of opinion on a bill that he supports, and I look forward to the dialogue about um, that piece of legislation. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, of course, all of you, thank you for being there at the State of the College at the Toyota showroom. A big thank you to Toyota for hosting us and sponsoring us, uh, as well as Moss, uh, the business panel, the student speaker were amazing, and big shout out to Nicholas Robles um, and Catherine Abbott for putting together what I thought was a really stellar event. I've got nothing but, but positive responses from the event, and I wanna thank all of the trustees for attending and supporting it. On February 21st, we also welcome students to the campus from Kansai University in Japan. Um, Yolanda Bender hosted a, a day uh, for the students to learn from students in the United States and also for them to share. Uh, I was there for a presentation on Japanese culture. Our own Marbella made a dinner for the students. So thank you Marbella for, for your uh, hospitality to the students. Uh, and Cody and Yolanda have done a great job at really building that relationship out. Um, what I thought was so cute is that they, I asked them what they had enjoyed the most about being in America, and they told me, Del Taco. <laughs> um, but that was before they had Marbella's cooking. So I'm, I'm assuming that that improved. Um, 
So uh, I wanted to alert the board to the fact that I've been appointed as uh, the CEO representative on the AB 1111 project, which is common course numbering. According to the legislation, all courses will have a common course number throughout the higher education public system. We had our first meeting in February, and that'll be about an eight-month project for us to implement. And I think it'll go a long way toward helping our students transfer and make it more streamlined um, for them. Uh, we had our second dual enrollment open forum on February 26th. I want to thank Corbin Wild um, and the faculty and staff who are participating in the dual enrollment advisory committee, which is now underway. Um, we've had some very productive conversations with both the association and the Senate about expanding our platform in dual enrollment and creating better access and equity um, through the dual enrollment approach. Uh, I participated in pizza and putting on March 3rd for President Circle at Shadow Mountain Golf Resort. And despite the fact that I've not held a club in 30 years, I was on the third place team. Don't know how that happened. Um, it's a freak of nature that anything like that would occur. Um, I also gave presentations to the La Quinta Rotary, uh, the Palm Springs Roundtable, as well as the Women's Club at the Springs, where Sarah Fry also joined me to present on nursing. Uh, to talk about the value of community college um, and the importance of COD to the community. Uh, I was also a guest lecturer at an EDD seminar for Cal State San Bernardino and invited to return. Um, had a board meeting for the Learning Lab this month, which is developing projects and grants that support AI development and intersegmental partnerships between UC and CSU. Um, as well as the two by two meeting that our true trustees both um, discussed in their reports. And although a campus isn't feasible at this time in DHS, um, I pledge and commit that the district will do more to make education accessible in that community. Um, and Val Garcia and I are already having some of those conversations. Um, and then last, our own B. Gonzalez was awarded last week as the Classified Administrator of the Year Award from Coachella Valley Unified School District. And I wanted to extend our congratulations to her. We're very proud of her. And congratulations from the board as well. Uh, at this time, thank you, President Hope. Um, at this time, we'll move into the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda will be considered for approval by a single vote without discussion. Any board member may request that an item be pulled from the consent agenda to be discussed and considered separately in the action agenda. Are there any requests to separately consider any of the consent items? I have one, Madam Chair. Huh? Uh, on 9.2. Item 9.2. Yeah, if we can consider item one and two. Items one and two. Do you want them considered together or separate? Together. One and two considered together. For a separate vote. Well, together, but for, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you, but we can bring yes. them up together. So I'll just have to have a split thing there. Okay. And then uh, number nine. Number nine? Yes. On that same item? Yes. Okay, and that one's separate? Yes, and 9.5 is within that as well. And number five, this is all under 9.2? No. Oh. This is 9.5 and 9.10. Oh, 9.5? And 9.10, I have some questions on that. And 9.10, you want all those items pulled? Yeah, and then I know that 19.1, we're going to have an actual presentation, right? Which one? Okay. So we're good. I'm good. Okay, so we're pulling items 9.2 so that we can consider items 1 and 2 separately. We're con pulling item 9.10. And number 9 under 9.2. And number 9. Okay. So we're doing a three-way split there when we get to that one. Is that right? 
Okay. And okay, and then we're pulling item um, 9.10 and 9.5. Yes. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have pulled items 9.2, 9.5, and 9.10, and we will consider them under action agenda items um, in just a few moments. But uh, all the other consent agenda items, unless there's anything else anyone liked, would like to have pulled? Nope, see none. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items with the exclusion of those being pulled? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. And could we have a roll call vote? There's no discussion on this. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Perez is absent. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman, I think, just stepped out. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. And those <laughs> items have all been approved. At this time, we're going to move into action agenda item. And at this time, we will consider the items that were pulled from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Do I have a motion to approve the former 9.2, which is now 12.01? It moves down, right? Uh-huh. And like where's Cardinals? <laughs> it, it becomes item 12, right? Because it was Yeah, uh -huh. I, I mentioned it as 12.01. It'll become 12.01. So moved. So moved, and do we have a second? Second. So um, would you like to make another motion where we consider 9.02 with the exclusion of items one, two, and nine? So moved. Okay, thank you. Is yeah. there a second to that? Madam Chair, if I may. So right now we would need a motion to divide. Oh, okay. Uh, a motion, the motion to divide to the divide. item, and we're dividing items uh, the items that one, two, Gonzalez and nine mentioned. out. One, two, and nine. Yes. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that was the implication. But, but I didn't mention divide. Mm -hmm. So we're dividing. Motion to. So divide. we have to have the motion to divide, and then we approve the other items. Correct. Okay. So we are going to make a motion to divide item nine point two or the new twelve point zero one into items one and two. Can we do a three-way division at this point? So, yes. Yeah, so right now we're, okay. we're dividing out those subsections, and then those individual subsections would each have an action to approve them. Well, we're going to do two of them to the together. Top. Yeah, one, yes. one and two hey, you can, could, can be Oh, can I just together. make the division so that I have 12.01? Um, we're taking out items 1 and 2. To con we're dividing to consider 1 and 2 together, and then item 9 by itself, and then all the rest together. Yes. Acceptable? She said yes. Okay. And do I have a second? Could I have a second on this motion? This is the one to divide so that we consider parts 1 and 2 together, item 9 by itself, and then all the rest of nine the former 9.2 as one part. Seconded. Oh, second. Thank you. Okay. It has been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion besides it being very awkward? Nope. Okay. Could we have a roll call vote? Yes. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Perez is absent. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Passes. Thank you. Okay, now we are going to consider everything except for the other two sections under 12.01 will now be everything with the exclusion of items one and two and item nine. Correct. This would be a motion to approve item 12.01 as amended. 12.01 as amended. Okay. And I see a nod for an emotion, so can I have a nod for a second? Anyone? Or a hand or a verbal? I need a second on this to consider. 
for us to take a vote. Second. Thank you. Okay, is there any discussion on the other items of nine of uh, twelve point zero one? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote? Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Perez is absent. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. You're doing Trustee... a great job, Bonnie, by the way. <laughs> Trustee <laughs> Thank you. Stefan. I don't feel like it. <laughs> Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, now, this is going to be item 12.02. Uh, so it can, it can live as a subsection of item 12.01. So right now we would be taking a motion to approve items 1 and, one two. and 2. Yes, okay. within 12.01. Okay, so now we're, we're looking at a motion to approve one, items 1 and 2 of 12.01. For discussion, correct. That's for what the motion is for. For discussion, yes. But we need to have a motion that says approve or disapprove. Does that make sense? The motion has to state one way or the other, correct? correct. Yes. So you need to make a motion in order to have discussion. You can't have discussion without a motion. Okay. So we're just approving the discussion. Correct. Well, you, okay. yes, the the mo yes, okay. the motion is to approve well, the item and let's then have discussion. Get, to explain that a little just further. just to clarify, there needs to be a motion on the floor before the floor can be open for discussion. So, I believe the request from Chair Stefan will be a motion to approve items one and two, uh, and if there's a second, then you could have a discussion on items one and two. Is that helpful for clarity? Yeah, because we want to we want to be able to discuss it. Is that correct? And there will be a vote after the discussion as well? Yes. And can um, I ask IT to put um, items one and two on the screen, please, for the edification of the board? Please, yeah. Good idea. The list, the purchase order list. <clears throat> We're opening a, attachment A. A. Okay. No, the 9.2. Oh, contracts, sorry, not purchase. Okay, sorry. List of contracts. There you go. One and two. One and two. Thank we'll you. Talk about, we'll talk about nine later. Um, again, for me, on on this, uh, I'll make it really clear. And I've- Did you make, we need a motion. Oh, sorry. Before. I'm sorry. Um, sure, we'll motion. She made the motion. Can we have a second so we can discuss this, please? This is for discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. Discussion, and then we have to vote. After. Okay. Yes, we have a first and a second. So now discussion. I'm sorry. Now back to you. Okay. So, you know, again, I just want to you know, make it very clear that it's not that I do not support a West Valley campus, but I cannot vote on this uh, knowing that our data and the expert advice that we received um, previously uh, does not support project of this magnitude okay and that's for both yes parts one and two <coughs> okay is there any further discussion I'm not quite sure I, I understood what she was saying what you're was saying you'd like her to clarify yes please which part Ron? Um, the previous recommendation and from whom the experts that have spoken yeah, what, during oh, open board meeting. These are private people or someone from the college? Private. That we hired to give us a report. I believe it, the report was last year in the spring, April. It's, it's been a while. Uh, March, April of last year. That was before I came. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, a roll call vote, please. And is this voting to approve or not approve? This was to approve. Okay. Thank you. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Perez is absent. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Nay. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion passes. 
Okay, and that will move us down to item 9 under 12.01. And we need a motion to bring it forward so we can discuss it as well. So moved. Is there a second? Oh, that was a second? No. Number item nine. nine. IT, if we can pull that document back up and scroll down to number item number, number nine. nine. Thank you. And this is under 9.02, attachment A. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Down to nine. Perfect. Oop, right there. Oh, oops. A little too far. Thank you. Okay, we need a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded, so discussion? Yes, on this one I, have, I actually do have a question. Um, I noticed that multiple projects are lumped together uh, for the cost, and I'm wondering why they're not separated so that we're able to see how much of the funding is going to each versus just the total and lumping them together. Trustee Gonzalez? If I can ask uh, Vice President Garcia to answer the question for you to clarify. Sure. So this is legal fees that helped us get through the new market tax credit issuance that um, probably say we actually did close. So they're not, they're associated with projects, but this one was particular for the Indio campus expansion. We have done one for the child development. So we're just listing all the projects that can qualify for the new market tax credit. I actually, just for you know transparency, I would like to see it individually. I think that would help me. So just for clarification, the, the legal fee, I think one of the challenges is the legal, the legal fees are inclusive of all of these because they're all eligible. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, if I'm understanding Vice President Garcia properly, um, when they give us the legal advice about the new market tax credit, it's not advice for each project. It's advice for all of the projects that are eligible. Is that correct? Correct. And the funding is actually coming out of the proceeds of the new market tax credit. So it doesn't come out of the wallet. Correct. No. Yes, this has nothing to do with bond projects. And it could it could be related. We could have a new market tax credit with any project on that list. Correct. Correct. At any time. I don't know if, if uh, having our general counsel help us with that might be useful too, Trustee Gonzalez. Just to, just to clarify, the, the work that bond counsel are doing here uh, would uh, provide support potentially for each of these projects. They would The work that they're doing is holistic. So it isn't really separated out by project. The legal work that they're doing would support each of those projects. So I, I don't believe that they will be uh, separating out on a project basis because the legal background and backbone work that they're doing on the new market tax credits would support uh, all of those projects. It's the same work, if that's helpful. Mm. Maybe I'll get into a little more conversation offline. Okay, any further discussion or questions? Sorry, I should ask for questions every time too. Huh? Questions? No? Nope. Seeing none, um, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. I'll abstain on this. Okay, abstain and Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, that, thank you. That brings us down to the action for Board of Trustees 13.01, Board Policy 39.50, COVID-19 vaccine. This is the second reading. Madam Chair, so yes. I, I believe we have two other items that were pulled. Oh, I, I jumped. I'm sorry. I have them all listed separately. So I have next um, item 9.05, which was pulled and is now 12.02, correct. Um, the form of 9. 5, 05 is now 12.02. Correct. Um, could I have a motion that we consider this item? So moved. And could I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Could we have discussion, please? 
questions. Should they pull it up? Just yeah, can we have yeah, uh, IT pull that up, please? I'm so sorry. If we could pull up, this is item 9.05, budget transfers under consent. And it's the attachment within the item. Yes. Okay. Again, just for, for clarification for me, and you know, it could just be me that, that is asking this, but I'm just wondering um, which projects are, are included in the capital outlay fund? Vice President Garcia, can you help us? Yes, yeah, so in the capital, it's, uh, these funds are all associated with non-bond funds. So anytime you see Fund 41, there's just capital outlay. So it includes a lot of, um, the reason you're seeing this transfer now is because at the time of the budget development, a lot of these projects weren't identified. So now that they are, we've actually created specific funds for them and we're moving those funds um, to there. And they, they range from uh, security camera projects, um, renovation of restrooms. Um, I can provide a list for you. We do have a detailed list of what um, these projects are. Well, if you would, please, that would be great. Okay. Hopefully some of the projects in here will address some of the concerns. That they will. Forth by mm -hmm. CSEA. Yeah, and we're, we've been working on that, and we've been in communication with the association about the installations. Um, and just to clarify, yes, none of these are included as bond projects. They're all other um, maintenance and support um, projects. Right. So there's that, things that we identify for existing as camps. roofing, carpeting, painting, mm -hmm. a lot of different things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, IT, for pulling that up. This is great. Very helpful. Thank you. Is there any other questions, concerns, discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries. And at this time, we'll move into 12.03. This was the former 9.10. If we could have that on the screen, please. Could I have a motion to approve? Uh, so moved. Second. I need a second so we can consider this and discuss it. Was that a second? Need a second. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a second. Okay, now discussion. Question. Um, I, I see that uh, some of them, I believe, are cost and others are uh, rebates. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for it to, to scroll. <laughs> Um, no, no specific question on, on the, ex the expenditures, but I just think for anyone uh, watching, and I think our, our audience is growing um, online, can we just get a, a brief description if anything um, was needed additional funds or if anything is a reimbursement to us? Yes, and you know one of the things that I think that... Um, has been challenging about the Indio campus expansion is because we had issues around um, supply chain mm -hmm. um, that delayed the project, which created situations where costs increased around both labor and materials. Um, and so a lot of those increases are around having to address those delays. Vice President Garcia, did you want to add more to that? Yes, yeah, so we are, so it was because our steel company went bankrupt. So there was a significant delay in that project. Um, all these increases that you're seeing here, we are keeping track of them, and we are gonna be looking into being reimbursed for all of them. Whether we're gonna be reimbursed for all, we don't know, but that is our goal. And the ones that you see as uh, the negative change orders, you'll see most of them are all Indio child development. As a project closes and we have unspent funds, Basically, we just do deduct change orders. So you can see, that, which means that we've actually done a good job in, in saving funds and not spending all the POs that are out there. Thank you. 
Vice President Garcia, would it be possible want to give the board an update on the um, rebates once we conclude the pursuit of those um, those claims? Sure. Okay. So we can bring that back to you, Trustee Gonzalez, and the board, just so you can see where we had success in those rebates and where we didn't. And it will probably be towards the end of the project. That way we can uh, accumulate what all those additional costs are. Or give a more accurate accounting. That, that's acceptable. It looks great, by the way. I love when I drive by there and I see the Very exciting. The progress. It's, it's just beautiful. You should know that I've talked to the director, um, Jessica, who is here, and uh, we're looking to set up a tour for the trustees once we're able uh, to do it when it's less dusty. Mm. Correct? Ms. Ender, D Dr. Enders? We've died. <laughs> good, good luck with that. <laughs> Can we put put in a work order for no wind on the day that we that we have a tour? Yes. I'm looking forward to that. That that's going to be great. But the the project itself looks amazing. But thank you, uh, VP Garcia, for for that. Madam Chair. Yes. I want to say I'm there a couple of days a week, and the progress is really, it's really something. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing is that we're moving forward, and the community needs to know that the funding for these projects and these increases are there, and thank you any time for the savings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you, Trustee Odin, 100%. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions, concerns, or discussion on this item? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? <coughs> Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. I motion passes. Okay. We've concluded all of the 12 point. Um, okay, now we go on to 13.01. This is board policy 3950, COVID-19 vaccine second reading. Do I have a motion to accept item 13.01 as presented? I moved. Second. Okay, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? And seeing none, President Hope, could we have a roll call vote, please? Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And now we'll consider 14.01, Public Employee Appointment Dean. It is now time to consider item 14.01 on the agenda wherein it is recommended that the board approve the appointment uh, employment agreement of the Dean of Applied Sciences and Businesses. The recommended, recommended action will approve the employment agreement for the Dean commencing on March 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025 with salary placement at range 11. Column 10 for an annual salary of $197,208. Dollars and 14 cents, as well as provisions for evaluation and fringe benefits comparable to other similar leadership employees. Do I have a motion to improve the employment agreement as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Congratulations. And roll call vote. President. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Congratulations, Dean Lingle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now we move on to 15.01 budget revisions. Do I have a motion to approve item 15.01 as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, President Hoke? Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, next item is 15.02, notice of intent to award a contract. Do I have a motion to approve item 15.02? As presented. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. 
Any discussion? None. Roll call vote, President Hope. Student Trustee Zarco. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And at this time, we'll move on to information items for the Board of Trustees. 16.01, the California Community College Trustees, the CCCT 2024 Board Elections. At this time, um, it's being presented as information to inform the board that an email will be sent by the president's office with the candidate information. Trustees, please review the information and provide your choices of top candidates to Armando via email before the next board meeting. Are there any questions from the board? Let me remind the board that these individuals represent our college. Um, they have sent out their bios. Um, I think the they may have sent even letters from their college to each of you. Um, plus um, the triple CT, uh, California Community College Trustees Association has sent out information, applications, and information about each individual. Please review those and try to figure out which one, in your opinion, is the most qualified to represent us, okay? I know in the past many times many of you may have felt that I knew these people better than you and you might have just not voted. Um, it's up to each and one of us to consider each of the people's bios, okay? You might have a different perspective. There might be something that you see in a bio that I might have missed, even though I might know them personally, okay? So please review their bios. Plus, there are always new people that run for these positions, and they should all be considered equally, okay? So please vote so that we have that information to go on. The next item is 17.01 investment report, October 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023. This item is being presented as information only and no action is needed from the board. Are there any questions on this investment report? Any concerns? Anything you wanna discuss? Seeing nothing, we will move on. Uh, 17.02, this is the cost of bond sale um, respecting Desert Community College District General Obligation Bonds Election of 2016 Series 2024, the Series 2024 bonds. This item is being presented as information only. If there are questions, we have someone available to address them. Otherwise, no action is needed from the board. Does anyone have any questions? If you do have questions later when you re re uh, review this, please let Armando know so that we can get those questions answered. 17.03, uh, Administrative Procedures 3720, Computer Network Use. This item is being presented as information only if there are questions. We can address them. Otherwise, no action is needed from the board. Are there any questions? Seeing none. 17.04, Administrative Procedure 6535, Use of District Equipment. This item is being presented as information only. If there are questions, we can address them. Otherwise, no action is needed from the board. Are there any questions? And 18.01, Chapter 4, Administrative Procedures. This item is being presented as information only. If there are questions, we can address them. Otherwise, no action is needed from the board. Are there any questions? And at this time, we are going to go into a study session. Um, with 19.01, the 2024-2025 state local budget outlook. Um, President Hope, would you please help us introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Chair Stefan. Um, I've asked Vice President Garcia to provide this update about the California state budget um, and the outlook 
and um, contingency plans that the chancellor's office, the legislative analyst's office, and the legislature are, are all engaging in. Um, I wanted to bring to the board's attention, you might have seen the news item that Coachella Valley Unified um, laid off a number of instructors last week. Um, that is also true with 200 positions being laid off in Pasadena, another 200 of certificated personnel being laid off in San Diego. And while that may not be indicative for what our future holds, it certainly is a canary in the coal mine as we evaluate the future of California's state budget as it affects higher education. So um, Mr. Garcia is going to provide you with the latest that we understand, but also take, keep in mind, this is a fastly, fast changing um, uh, situation in California and we won't really probably know very much until June. So Mr. Garcia. Okay, well good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board, uh, today I will be presenting a budget outlook uh, for 24-25. As President Hope mentioned, this is really early in the process, but there are a lot of concerning things that we are seeing. Um, in January, the legislative office had um, informed us that the state budget had increased from $48 billion to $68 billion. Unfortunately, since then, the budget, the deficit has increased again. So currently now it's at $73 billion um, statewide. In January, we were also, based on their proposal, community colleges were protected, but because of these continued increases to the deficits, that could be at risk. And it's, as you can see here, the state has considered various options to mitigate the shortfall. Uh, among those are tax increases, cuts to program and services, use of rainy day funds, deferrals, which can create a cash flow issues. So that's one of the things that we always have to make sure that we have a healthy fund balance in this district. And I know currently, as of June 30th of last year, it was about $232 million. And I know I've made presentations in the past where I thought this an institution this size should have about $50 million of fund balance. And one of the reasons is due to this. Um, the state has uh, Im implemented deferrals in the past where community colleges haven't received funding for one, two, three months. And what does that mean? That means we have to cover our payroll. We have to cover our expenses. So just as information item, or as you've seen in our warrants, um, A warrants, our payroll is between six and seven million dollars a month. So $32 million can go pretty quick after a couple months. Um, so we want what we want to try to avoid is having to borrow money with cops and trans because we know when we borrow money, it just costs more money. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to avoid that. Um, One of the yeah. things that they're looking at as well is one-time um, fund takebacks. Um, it's I've never seen it before up until this year. So this year they actually took back half of the deferred maintenance and instructional equipment funds that they had allocated. So not only did they cut it, they actually gave it out and halfway through this year, they said, you know what? Give us back half of it. Fortunately for College of the Desert, we hadn't spent it all. Unfortunately, from some of the districts they had, they had to figure out how to come up with that money. And it was a significant amount of money. Just College of the Desert alone was over $5 million that they were asking for back. So we knew once they set that precedence, that's one something else that they were gonna be looking at on a year-to-year -year basis. So not good for us. Um, Others, though, the LAO has suggested the legislature reject many of the governor's proposals. Um, one of those is to hold community colleges flat. What does that mean? Is eliminating the $60 million investment to nursing education that they had proposed in January, the, eliminate the 0.76% COLA that was also in the January proposal, and they're also asking for additional policy changes. Hello? One of those is eliminating funding for physical education, athletics, and other enrichment activity classes. I've been in the system for a little bit over 20 years. I've never seen them discuss this as an item that could be put on the table. Increase in enrollment fees from 46 to $50, uh, also in eliminating the Promise Program, which covers two years of enrollment fees for our students that qualify to be in this program. 
So you can see they're looking at a lot of different things in order to, to mitigate these um, issues. Here is a list that of, um, it's not exclusive to just this list, but there's a list of one-time funds that they've already given out that they're looking to pull back. I won't go through the entire list, but you can see here, um, one, of, and one of the reasons we know some of these are on the list is because they're already inquiring, not only from the College of the Desert, from all, but from all community colleges, how much of these funds have you already spent? So the second we hear that, they're like, uh-oh, they're looking to take some of these funds back. Um, one of the things that I think we need to be careful, not only with the previous slide, but, but all these items is, we are in an election year. So the likelihood that any action is taken before November might be real low. Um, but that doesn't mean that they won't, after November, they'll implement uh, mid-year cuts or deficit us in uh, future years. So regardless of how, you know, how the economy is actually trending. So with a perfect example of that is current year. So currently the revenues are not materializing as expected. There's a $32 million shortfall for property taxes this year. P1 for our funding model came out uh, at the end of February and there is a 3.55% deficit in there. We were expected and we were told it was gonna be roughly close to a 1% and now it's 3.55%. What does that mean? $3.3 million for College of the Desert alone. And what's the difference between deferrals and deficits? Well, deferrals just means we will give you your funds sometime later in the future, either in that year or actually the following fiscal year. Deficits means we don't have enough money, we will never give you this money back. Um, K-12s have automatic backfills for deficits, community colleges do not. So when we see deficits, basically it's money that we will never receive. So that's, as you can see, just for this current year. We still don't know where that's gonna end up by the end of this year, but uh, the fact that it's actually trending upward is not a good thing, because usually they start with a high number and it trends downward. Um, there is a, uh, a new attendance and accounting system that's gonna be implemented next year, and one of the things that we are noticing is that it's actually affecting our FTS in a neg negative way, not just College of the Desert, but a lot of community colleges across the state. Um, and not because of what we're generating, it's just basically the way they're calculating it. It's reducing our FTS. So we're gonna continue to monitor that. There is uh, other things that we're looking at, other post-employment benefits. As of June 30th, our current liability was $10.2 million. There is a irrevocable trust that was set up. Currently there's $4.4 .4 million in there, um, which leads to our, uh, our net liability of $5.8 million. The goal of the district is to have this fully funded within the next five years. Um, one thing that that will create is obviously when it's an irrevocable trust, now you cannot touch those funds, so your liquidity uh, gets hurt a bit. But what this does is it, once you're fully funded, you could actually pay your pay as you go, meaning all the expenses that you pay for your actual retirees now, out of this irrevocable trust, which would free up other funds from the district. To, to do whatever we need to do. So moving forward, some of the things that we're gonna be doing is advocating for community colleges. If they're looking to pull back, we're gonna be advocating for deferrals and not deficits. Uh, we're advocating for no pullbacks because it really hurts us in the planning phase. If we think we're getting $10 million and we start planning for it, and then halfway through the year, we find out that it's only 5 million, then it creates a problem across the board and no cuts to programs and services. Uh, some of the things we'll continue to do is analyze every position that has become vacant. We won't just automatically backfill. Uh, look to improve our uh, student retention. Uh, look for growth. So really, enrollment growth is gonna be the key component for our recovery. That, again, not, doesn't necessarily only mean increase our student headcount. Retention is a big part of this too. If we can retain the students we currently have, will also help with our growth. So as President Hope said, this is still really early in the phase, but it is not looking good. And we haven't seen it this bad in quite a long time. Um, and from now to May, revised June, there's gonna be a lot of lobbyists 
pushing legislature uh, really to look at their own interests. So, so we do have our advocacy in the state, so we will continue to do that. So with that, I thank you, and I'll leave it up to you. Any questions? You also have a little uh, oh, yes. handout in the packets. Do you so want to in the about? packet, Nicholas Robles <clears throat> put together uh, with my help a, a one pager. It has a lot of information on there, um, but you can you know you can pick and choose what you want to look at. But we try to put as much information in that one sheet as you can. That way, you can always refer back to it. And again, a lot of these numbers are as of today. You know, in May June, it might be different. We'll, we'll get a better picture in May. I think um, if I could also just make a comment to the board about, you know, when I first arrived, there were a few things that the district was interested in exploring. For instance, um, full benefit health care for part-time faculty, for instance. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of the, the faculty were advocating for is inclusion in that program because it was funded by $200 million. And one of the things I said at the time is that when the chancellor's office tells you that the money is ongoing, it's only ongoing until it isn't. Um, and we're in that moment now where those dollars are likely to evaporate. And so, you know, thinking carefully about our long-term commitments, you know, is incredibly important so that we can be better prepared when these moments occur. And I support um, Mr. Garcia's approach to uh, the ending fund balance. As, and the conservatism toward the budget that we're starting to um, live into, not to be alarmist, right? None of us want to be alarmist, but at the same time, we're trying to be cautious and planful as we go into this next, next six to eight months. It's definitely concerning and scary, but Nicholas, I have to say that even though the information is bleak, it looks really nice. Only the information, but I, <laughs> only the colors and whatnot. But yeah, no, this is uh, definitely concerning. Um, and just to clarify with the school district, uh, there were March 15 notices, so not necessarily the actual you number of, of layouts. Of course, I'm not in a capacity to speak for them. Sure. But, but I do have the, the knowledge. Um, yeah. One of the things we are seeing actually across a lot of community colleges when we're there are a lot of community colleges already looking into uh, layoffs, furloughs, rollbacks, a lot of different things. We're not quite there yet, but we're seeing it across the state. And I think those of you that were on the board last May will probably remember when I came back from the Triple CT conference, I said that things weren't looking good with the budget. I didn't know when we were going to get more information. We'll it's coming down now. Um, a lot of the colleges that were petrified last May um, were big colleges. And as far as I know, they're as petrified now. And some of them are making those bigger cuts. So, so far, we've been very lucky. But we're going to have to really consider things. The back side of this page is what is COD doing to mitigate the impact um, Hopefully, those will be some good things. Hopefully, I'll get some more information when I'm at the chancellor's informational um, session next month. And um, and we're looking at where we're going to go in five to seven years because I don't know what's going to happen. None of us have that crystal ball, unfortunately. No matter how long you've sat here, no matter how long you've been involved with this or how much you know, you don't have a crystal ball. And... Um, all we can do is gather the information and and do the best we can with it. We've been in uh, a hard spot before. I remember under um, President Patton, we sat there and we were looking at five years. What were we going to do to mitigate the problem with the budget for the next five years? And the faculty became very involved with that process. We set up committees and things across the campus and we attacked it from that perspective. When I was first elected in 1999, um, I had to have back surgery and I believe it was 2001 I was off work with my back. 
Um, when I came back, we were looking at laying off individuals because the budget was so poor. And um, the problem was we were able to mitigate that as or take it down a few notches, but uh, and then the problem seemed to dissolve. We don't know from time to time. So this is something we need to take serious. This is something we need to look at. We need to really think about. Um, I always tell people I do my best thinking when I'm sleeping. They say that's actually true, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, it wakes me up in the night, you know. Um, so if you wake up with some great idea, please write it down. Bring it in. You know, it might seem far-fetched to you, but um, you never know. You know, because it could be something that's totally out of the box that might work uh, when it's something like this. So I appreciate the information being brought forward so that we're all informed and all on the same page as far as we know at this time. And like um, I said, you know, sometimes the June revise, you know, things work themselves out. But the thing is, this is an election year, and people will do and say a lot of things to get us to get reelected, and then we find out the next year that things are six times as bad or ten times as bad. So we've got to be vigil on this, and we've got to um, try thinking outside that box, and we've got to keep ourselves informed and keep listening for what might be out there and what other colleges are doing. Okay. Chair Stefan, if I can also thank Vice President Garcia for his leadership over these um, this fluid situation. Um, and I would note that one of the important elements on the um, collateral that Mr. Robles has created is the college needs to continue to be very watchful of the percentage of the total operating budget that's assigned to salaries and benefits. Right now, that's approximately 84%. We definitely do not want to go higher than that. Um, when you see colleges that are in trouble, they're, they're at 92, 93, 94%, and it takes all the discretion out of their budget planning. So despite the fact that this is some alarming news, we do have some flexibility that's the result of some good planning, um, and I, we just want to continue to be mindful. Madam Chair. Yes. Under the uh, mitigating the impact, the introduction of fast track classes, could you say something about that, please? Yeah, so College of the Desert, um, Trustee Odin has been um, kind of dabbling in short term offerings and access points for a bit. Um, the data on those offerings, which are approximately eight weeks generally, is so good. Um, and that those classes fill so readily that we've amplified the number of eight-week sessions that we are offering in the schedule of classes, thanks to the department chairs and the deans and our scheduler and Vice President Martinez Garcia. So um, we look for that to continue to increase because, as was mentioned, our FTES and headcount are very important as we look to be rebenched in 2025. I, I do want to thank you, President Hope, for your leadership and you know your cabinet as well, um, because I I do know from the short time that I am able to to interact with all of you, um, I I know that you're doing everything you can yep. to ensure that our students uh, and future students are able to enroll quickly. Um, I was so happy when I heard you say that at the state of the college, we're we're down to an hour. It's just amazing. I've been putting that out there, you know, just hoping that we're able to recruit uh, more students, either coming directly out of high school mm -hmm. or even those that may just want a career change or, mm -hmm. you know, just further their their educational goals. Um, but, you know, and I I see here too, even though our campuses look beautiful, I'm seeing here where it's also stating that they're going to require additional funding. So that's scary too, but. I think the best we can do is is work with our our community and uh, you know offer courses that our community needs mm -hmm. and is looking for and hopefully you know we're able to withstand and and hold our ground here. Um, 
But I agree with Trustee Stefan. I mean, we never know where it's going to end. You know, we still got May revise coming, and there's just there's so much. But but I do want to appreciate all of the efforts that I see from the team on President Hope. So thank you for that. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Anyone else have anything they want to add? Um, not seeing anything else. Thank you again, Vice President thank Garcia. You. I know this is a tough subject to discuss. I know. And, uh, <laughs> One day I'll bring good news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least it's over for today. Right? Orban is starting to call him Downer Garcia. No. <laughs> I mean, he, he has to bring us, you know, the truth. And he did it in so, pretty colors, right? Yeah. Let's look on the positive. Not here. always great news. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that brings us to 19.02, legislative update. President Hope, could you please help us introduce this item? Yes. Thank you, Trustee Stefan. Um, wanted to uh, give an opportunity for our new general counsel, Jacob Knapp, um, to present to the board about some of the opportunities that we can engage all of the trustees in, in terms of the advocacy work that we so desperately need, especially at this very dynamic time. Um, because trustee, because uh, General Counsel Knapp has uh, experience with the legislature, with the chancellor's office, with the league, um, I've asked him to include in the breadth of his assignment um, providing you with regular legislative updates. Um, and so this first presentation is a way just to set the groundwork um, for some of those efforts going forward. So thank you, Mr. Knapp. Thank you, President Hope. Uh, Chair Stefan, uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez, members of the board, it's a pleasure to be before you this morning to provide a brief overview uh, of the legislative process. And some of this may be uh, a little elementary because you're so experienced with how the legislature itself works. But I do think, as President Hope was saying, given where we are in this uh, time of, of flux statewide with the budget uh, and with other matters, uh, there are opportunities for the College of the Desert to engage on the statewide level, uh, both with the legislative process and with the, uh, the state chancellor's office uh, when the Board of Governors is promulgating regulations under Title V that impact us all. Uh, so I want to provide a brief overview of how the legislature operates, uh, knowing that we will be working to engage in that process more frequently moving forward in, I think, a very positive way. Um, I was going to uh, sing the old Schoolhouse Rock uh, song on how a bill becomes a bill on Capitol Hill, but President Hope dissuaded me. Uh, instead, we'll do a, a quick run through on, on some slides. So uh, how is it that a bill uh, becomes a bill? It, it starts with an idea, and it can come from anywhere. Uh, it could be from uh, a legislator themselves, a member of the, the California Assembly or the Senate. Uh, the Assembly has 80 members. Senate has 40 members in California. It could be from the governor, governor's office, uh, one of the, the various state agencies uh, in the state administration, uh, or from local agencies. We could have some ideas here at the College of the Desert or through the Community College League of California that we can uh, have traction with a, a legislator who's willing to author a bill on behalf of the system or on behalf of a project or a program that's of interest to us, uh, businesses, Citizens, an idea can come from anywhere, and I put lobbyists in parentheses here because oftentimes these uh, ideas are communicated through professional lobbyists uh, when it comes to both on the governmental side and on the business side. Um, it's just a reality of the way that the system works. But uh, the idea can come from anywhere. And then how does that idea become an actual, the text of a bill? Um, first, the idea has to be embraced by a legislator. So a legislator, a senator, or assembly member has to be uh, willing to and agree to author a bill. Uh, that idea is then presented to the Office of Legislative Council, uh, which is uh, an office that supports the state legislature. They have about 80 attorneys who uh, draft bills, and they could be about any subject uh, that affects the state of California. I know quite a bit about this process because my wife is actually an attorney for the legislature and is in the Office of Legislative Council, uh, but they draft bills on any number of subjects, including bills that could end up in the education code. Uh, once the bill's drafted, the author, the legislator who embraced the bill, takes it uh, to either the Senate or the Assembly, depending upon which house they're a member of, uh, and they bring it to the desk for introduction and a first read. 
And then after the bill is read, it's numbered and printed, and at least 30 days have to pass before the bill can be moved on to committee. Um, here's a little chart that gives an overview of the process, just a reminder for, for, for you all and for more for the members of the public. Our state legislature operates in largely the same way that the federal uh, legislature works. There are two houses on the federal side. It's, it's the Congress and the Senate in, in, in California. It's the Assembly and the Senate. But a bill is introduced. You go through uh, the, the various committee hearings that are required. We'll talk about those briefly in a minute. And then assuming that the bill makes it through the various committees, uh, it goes to the floor of the, the originating house, the first house, uh, for approval. And if it's approved by the house, let's say it was the assembly, then it gets kicked over to the Senate. And it goes through the same process again, the same levels of committee hearings and approval from that larger body, uh, assuming that both houses agree on the bill language at the end of the day, it is passed on to the governor uh, for signature. So it's one of the reasons why the whole process takes so long, uh, but there are a lot of steps, including the various committees that a bill has to go through. So first the bill goes to, on either the Senate or the Assembly side, goes to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee assigns it, uh, assigns the bill to a, a, the appropriate policy committee. Many, most of the bills that would impact College of the Desert uh, that uh, are attempting to add language or amend language in the education code would end up uh, at the education committee, which would be the relevant policy committee uh, for those bills. The policy committee uh, would hold one or more hearings on the bill, uh, take in public testimony, receive input from the LAO, the Legislative Analyst's Office, um, and, uh, and then there's a vote in the policy committee. If the bill has a fiscal impact, assuming that the bill passed through the policy committee, if the bill has a fiscal impact, uh, or a state cost, uh, it would then be sent over to either the Senate or the Assembly Appropriations Committee uh, because uh, there's an additional step. It makes sense that there would be for any bills that have a significant cost to make sure that at the end of the day, as all the bills are coming through the process, there's a batch of bills sitting with, uh, with appropriations and we have a limited amount of funding tying back to Vice President Garcia's presentation. Uh, there are decisions that are then made in those committees about where the money is allocated. And if the bill passes through the fiscal committee, it's read twice more on the floor, and then it goes again through the same process on the other side, sort of like a Groundhog Day situation. Um, we do the whole process again through the committees in the second house. Let's assume that a bill gets through the first house, and then it goes to the second house, and the second house wants to change it. Uh, the second house makes amendments to the bill after the first house had already passed it. Um, they can make those amendments and see if the originating house concurs, and if they don't, there's a dispute resolution process that's built into the, to the legislative process called a conference committee. Uh, and the Rules Committee appoints members uh, to a conference committee to meet and negotiate differences between the versions of the bills that might be uh, in the Assembly and the Senate. And uh, if they agree on a single version, it's then passed back out to both houses for, for final approval. Uh, the governor does have the ability, sorry, I, my, I, my, it's a dad joke. You're going to probably see a few of these over time. Uh, my um, my ten year old asked if I was going to take a bow because that's what I do at home when I do a, a dad joke. But I said no uh, to approve or veto the bill. Um, the governor has twelve days to sign, um, and if the governor vetoes the bill, a two thirds vote in each house can override that veto. Uh, typically, bills uh, become effective uh, subsequent January first after it goes through the whole process. So that's a really quick version of the entire legislative process. Um, big picture, where do we fit in at College of the Desert uh, in the whole structure, hierarchy of laws? We won't go into a huge great detail here, but you know, we've got federal laws, the, the US Constitution, federal laws adopted by the federal Congress, which basically go through a very similar process, federal regulations that are implemented by federal uh, administrative agencies, those are all sort of a supreme to what we do in California. California can adopt laws that are not inconsistent, largely speaking, uh, with areas that the federal Congress has adopted laws. And then in California, we have our own constitution, as you know. Uh, we just talked about laws that are, can be adopted by uh, the legislature, signed by our governor. And then, uh, close to my heart, uh, we have the uh, Board of Governors uh, for the Community College System and the State, State Chancellor's Office. Board of Governors is a 17-member board. Uh, appointed uh, by various appointing authorities, 
And the Board of Governors has the authority to adopt and promulgate regulations that impact the community colleges. So those regulations in Title V need to be consistent with the Ed Code, but they sort of can, uh, can describe in more detail how to implement the policy of the state. I used to draft regulations and take those through the process when I was general counsel for the state chancellor's office and the board of governors. Um, and there were opportunities in the Title V process as well for us to advocate uh, from our perspective at College of the Desert uh, when regulations are being promulgated in Sacramento as well. And then we fit in uh, at the end, uh, as we move down the hierarchy of laws, College of the Desert Board of Trustees can adopt policies uh, and administrative procedures that govern what we do locally. So President Hope uh, mentioned SB 895 uh, earlier. This is the, the bill that's currently going through uh, the legislative process that would establish uh, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing pilot program, uh, which is very exciting. It could be very exciting for College of the Desert. So I wanted to use this as a little case study to show you the way that a bill works its way uh, through the process. Um, we've already discussed what this bill would do, so I'll, I'll move on past those details. Uh, this bill was introduced by Senator Roth on January 4th, 2024. It did, as we discussed, go to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee referred it on February 14th uh, to the Senate Education Committee as the appropriate policy committee for this bill. Uh, the Ed Committee uh, has a hearing scheduled for April 10th, 2024, where they'll take public input and receive uh, uh, an analysis from the LAO. Uh, then it's scheduled tentatively, if it makes it through the policy committee, uh, we're talking about SB 895, would go to the Appropriations Committee in mid-May, and then theoretically and hopefully, will, if it stays on track, will be uh, for a full vote of the Senate uh, toward the end of May. And again, assuming that SB 895 passes through all these committees and is approved by the Senate, it would then be kicked over uh, to the assembly to go through a very similar process. So why should we care here at College of the Desert about what happens in Sacramento? We've seen, we've seen it over and over how legislation and, and Title V regulations impact how we operate and how we serve our students uh, here at College of the Desert. And just within the last, uh, the last legislative cycle in 2023, there were bills that touched on student financial aid, dual enrollment, non-resident tuition exemptions, course material requirements, open meeting requirements with the Brown Act coming out of, uh, out of the pandemic and various public employment rules. So it's, it would, it's a great opportunity for us to keep an ear to the ground to know what's coming, but also to attempt to influence uh, working with the, the league uh, and with the chancellor's office, uh, the various bills that are being proposed and are working their way through the system so that we end up with policy that's sound on a statewide level and that we're ready to run with here at College of the Desert if and when it, it, is, uh, it is enacted. So as President Hope mentioned, we're opening a, a new sort of a government relations office. I'm really excited to be able to, uh, to be bringing you updates on legislation as it's working its way through the process of various bills. I'm happy to go advocate at hearings in Sacramento. I've testified at uh, policy committees of the legislature before. I know President Hope has as well. Um, happy to go advocate, uh, coordinate with the league, do whatever, whatever would be most beneficial to College of the Desert on the statewide level uh, and having influence in policy as directed by the board. And as there's an interest in engaging in those conversations, again, I think that there are a lot of opportunities and there's an, a level of importance given the budget where it is right now. Uh, this year and into the next fiscal year. And again, as mentioned, we have an opportunity to engage the state chancellor's office when they're promulgating Title V regulations as well. And I think that uh, uh, there are some opportunities there to, to get an ear and to, to make some changes that could be beneficial for us. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Are there any questions? Board, anybody have any questions? This is fantastic. Um news and as you both know because i've had the honor and pleasure of testifying um, as well uh we're comfortable closed yes take a little <laughs> yes. question because you sit for a really long time uh, i've been fortunate enough to be able to to speak on uh, behavioral health restorative practices and and whatnot which are things that you know will affect k-12 and beyond mm -hmm. um uh, colleges but i think this is uh, very exciting because at the end of the day 
this is how it it all happens. And it, yeah. and you're absolutely correct in saying that, you know, uh, if we don't monitor the legislation, then we are not cannot stay ahead of of it. Uh, even though you never know what the outcome is going to be. Right. Uh, but I, I think it's great, and I appreciate your experience uh, in this area, and I think that uh, you, I always believe that things happen at the perfect time. There you are. <laughs> that's, very, that's very kind, <laughs> so. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Trustee Oden. Thank you. Uh, just reminded me of my advocacy days. Uh, well, I was vice chair of Equality California and hmm. getting bills passed through the legislature. So thank you for the reminder and for the report. I hope they were all good memories. Good memories. Good. Good. <laughs> Other than the long eight hours of sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Any other board members? I do want to say I really appreciate this presentation. I know we're going to be getting more. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see our board become more and more involved with the legislatures, not only at the state level and local level, but also at the federal level. And um, that's one reason why we attend a lot of the state and the federal conferences to get those updates. And I know you're going to be going to Haku coming up. And um, I know some of you would like to get more involved in lobbying for our community college. So if you'll give me your name or Armando your name, that you'd like to be involved with that so that we could coordinate it with Jake through the president of the college, that would be great. And yeah, I know he's pulled me off of a legislator in the past. I've said that many, many times that, you know, sometimes we don't agree with our legislators or their attitudes. Mm -hmm. But um, so please, um, it is something that we can become involved in. It is something where we can have an effect. And I think that the time has come where we need to take a more active role at that level. So um, I encourage all my trustees to get involved at that and... Uh, and uh, we're just really, really lucky that we've got the individual that we have here. We, we are extremely fortunate that Jacob Knapp is here at College of the yes. Desert. And I know he'll be bringing things to you on a regular basis with ideas about ways for us to be more involved and advocate for this community. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times the pressure is on, you know, those that the folks in Sacramento see all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know they maybe don't see us as clearly um, or understand the needs of our communities as clearly. So having Jacob is going to be a tremendous source of um, really legacy style leadership that College of the Desert can engage in. And so I'm so appreciative to have Jacob on our team. That's very kind. I couldn't be more excited to be here. And I'm really looking forward to working with you all on not only the, the legislative advocacy, but I really can't emphasize this enough. The Title V piece is one that many districts don't engage as actively on. And as, as all of our faculty and staff and administrators and trustees know, that's really where the, the rubber hits the road a lot of times. And we do have opportunities to, to, to change and influence uh, regulations as they come through too. So happy to provide an overview of the regulatory process, but also don't want to bore you on that as well. Uh, but uh, I think we can engage in various areas. And I'm excited to, to help facilitate that. And I'm sure that we are all willing to support as well. Okay. I want to thank you so much, Jake. I mean, this is really great introduction to this and I know we're going to be going places with this are there's no other questions from the board we'll move on and thank, thank you. you thank you um, public comments a request to address the board of trustees regarding matters not on the agenda um, this is remote public participation is allowed and will be accepted in person by email um, to otp at collegeofthedesert.edu during the meeting and submitted for the record or by using the raise your hand function by joining the Zoom link. Each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes per topic. All comments must be submitted or brought forward prior to the end of the public comments section. As an additional note, this item is intended for members of the public who wish to speak regarding matters not related to the agenda. And do we have anybody that would like to speak to the board, please? There are no public comments at this time, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. That brings us to future agenda items. Future agenda items, student trustee Zarko. 
Uh, I have none at this time. Okay, uh, Trustee Perez is absent. Um, and, and let me say this, if you're ever absent and there's something you'd like to see as a future agenda item or questions that you might have that you're not gonna be present or able to participate in our meeting to ask, please forward them to Armando so that we can get them on the record and have you participate at least somewhat remotely. Uh, Trustee Odin. Yes, um, if we could get an update on campus safety um, and also if you, want, if you would set a time where we can get uh, any update on the, the two by two meeting uh, recommendations, okay? Yes, sir. And Trustee Odin. I mean, excuse me, I just asked. Trustee Kinman, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'd like to echo my colleague's uh, comment on safety and at major events as well. Where we, at major events as well. Okay. What do we do? Do we have security present? You know, those types of things. Okay. okay. Thank you. And Trustee Gonzalez. I, I would echo the sentiments of my fellow trustees, Kinnaman and Odin, in a presentation you know, with safety. I, we've had one in the past, but I don't think we've had one since Trustee Odin has been here. So it would probably be a good idea just for him and probably get an update on, again, the procedures, as Trustee Kinnaman mentioned, uh, safety. And um, I know I, I can't, forgive me, but I don't remember the response, but I know we were looking at two-way communication with local law enforcement. And I'm not sure if it was ever actually implemented or completed. I know there it was a process and there was some barriers, but I think that would be good to incorporate um, into that uh, presentation. I also wondered about the two by twos. I know that it was brought as an informational um, item and I know that Trustee Odin and I are assigned to, to Desert Hot Springs, but you know, if we can get an update as to the other the other cities, especially after hearing that excellent presentation from uh, from legal counsel. Um, I had also uh, requested, and I do see it on the list, um, for us to have a presentation on uh, the dual enrollment. And I see that it was it's scheduled for 2025, but can we have one now? Because I think it would be really great to see the growth. Because I know you know some of the plan. I've heard some of it. And I think it would be good for us. And, and again, just looking at um, you know the budget projection and whatnot, and that being one of the areas that's highlighted in the informational mm -hmm. um, flyer, I, I think it, it would be um, good to to have one sooner, uh, within the next month or so. And um, it made me curious when I was looking and listening to a VP Garcia on the budget. How how would these uh, shortfalls? or would they affect our EDGE pledge program? Uh, they definitely could because EDGE pledge is partly supported by AB 19 dollars. And so if those AB 19 dollars are pulled back, um, that could affect our capacity to serve students in EDGE pledge. Um, but we can provide a more comprehensive um, overview if that's something that you would like. So th those would be my ask, the two by twos, the safety, um, the dual enrollment, uh, this year, please, mm -hmm. in the next two, three months, and then uh, uh, some a presentation regarding an edge pledge. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and Trustee Kinman, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have anything else you wanted to ask? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and I'll um, forego anything at this time. Um, that concludes our open session meeting. At this time, the board will take a recess to close session, but we're gonna take a 15 minute um, recess before we go to close session. I believe now it is about 11.45? 11.50. 50. so at 12.05, we'll be inside our closed session room. Um, please remember, um, that we are gonna recess to close session and reconvene in there at 12.05. The live feed of this meeting will continue. Board members and president hope I ask that you please join the closed session at 12.05.
p.m. And I hope everyone has a lovely lunch. Okay. Here's the information.
We reconvened open session at 1.29 p.m. There was no reportable action taken in closed session. And I will now adjourn the regular meeting of the District Community College District Board of Trustees at 1.30 p.m. Thank you.